Hi everyone, my name is Abby Adam. I am a student fellow at um, the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. I am a junior and my major, I'm a history major and a public history minor. Today I'm here with um, Mr. Ernie Price, who is a former employee at um, national, the National Website Appomattox. Um, so today we will be talking about his experience and his work at Appomattox. So before um, we begin, um, could you provide some brief background on Appomattox for the viewers? Oh, sure. Um, so Appomattox is one of quite a few National Park Civil War sites in Virginia, um, all thematically tied to Antietam and Gettysburg, the, you know, the Eastern Theater, and you might say the culminating site of the Eastern Theater. So it's where Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army Building, Virginia on April 9th, 1865 to General Ulysses S. Grant. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions about Appomattox Courthouse is that the surrender didn't take place in the courthouse building. Uh, courthouse is the name of the entire village. Courthouse, two words, being a village versus courthouse, one word, being a building. Uh, but understandably, a lot of people come to the park expecting to see where Lee and Grant met in a courthouse building, but they actually met in the McLean House, a home in the village of the courthouse. And so, yeah, uh, the park um, preserves what's left of the original village. So it's not only a military site where two battles were fought, one on the evening of April the 8th and one on the morning of April the 9th, 1865, but it's also the setting of a village. And uh, of course, you know, the entire Civil War was fought on a civilian landscape. And so uh, the civilian story is, is very not only intertwined, but I would even say visceral at Appomattox because unlike the open fields where the fighting occurred, you literally have a village. There's an architectural story at Appomattox in addition to the topographical one uh, of the soldiers' maneuvers. So yeah, that's, to me, that's kind of Appomattox in a nutshell. Um, amazing place to visit if you haven't. Um, off, off the beaten path, but worth the trip. Yeah, it sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, so, granted, it sounds like a very um, interesting and engaging site, but what drew you, to, um, drew you personally to work there? Well, I happen to be from that area originally. I was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, and my undergraduate studies were at, and so Appomattox is right between Lynchburg and Farmville. And so after my freshman year of undergraduate school, I saw the opportunity to apply for a summer, summer seasonal job at Appomattox and spent that summer there. And that was my first deep introduction to the park service. I had visited some park sites, but I never thought of it as a job. I never thought of it as a career. Uh, and that summer, again, just luck was pretty small. Uh, but I, they, they hired four new seasonals that year. And they had a lot of turnover. So I happened to get on and, and truly fell in love with the place and fell in love with the job and the idea of researching and learning and to share it with people who are visiting the site. Uh, just seemed fantastic to me. It was unbelievable that I could do that uh, as a job. And so I started coming back summer after summer after summer, even through grad school, and then decided, you know, I worked at Appomattox as a seasonal, often on over a, uh, an eight-year period. And then I left and I worked at a lot of other National Park Service sites, but in 2008, I came back to Appomattox as the Chief of Interpretation and was there for 10 years until 2018. And what an amazing 10 years to be there. Range interpretive plan, kind of revisiting how we interpreted this site. But in 2014, we got to make a brand new film for the park. And in 2015, we had the 150th anniversary. And we got to have a big, big deal there. Uh, and there so many things that unfolded and, and blossomed interpretively at Appomattox. I, I would even call it a paradigm shift 
uh, that occurred from when I was there originally in 1987, um, I'm that old, um, all the way up to 2018. It, it was, it was, it, it's amazing to me how differently uh, we interpreted the same park in just a, you know, that window. Is the, um, Still there? Yeah, I think we're having a little bit of um, connection issues here. Yeah, but I think it's good for the most okay. part. Maybe in and out? Yeah, in and out a little bit. But um, it's good for the most part. But that was, um, can you still hear me? Okay, or? Yes, yeah, I got yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Um, it sounds like that must have been an amazing experience working for there so long and seeing so many um, aspects of the park kind of shift and change in its interpretation over time. So how would you say that um, the or overall historiographical discussion of Appomattox has changed um, over the various years that you've been working at the, that you had worked at the park? innovative even you know, well before I got there um, in 1971 Appomattox started a, a first person living history program and uh, that became more popular with other sites but Appomattox was among the, the first to engage in that but the program was built around one federal soldier union soldier and one, they would talk about their perspectives of the final campaign and the, the surrender, one obviously as you know, the Northern perspective, and then one was not just Southern, but, but local. And so uh, the, the cool part about that program is it progresses through the summer. So it's always that date, but the year is 1865. So the current events unfold. And the reason the federal soldier is there, and he's actually a Pennsylvanian, in fact, uh, in Appomattox that summer. And so um, this, you know, we would portray one of the men from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and then one of the local Appomattox soldiers who had been in the 18th Virginia in Lee's army who surrendered in his own hometown. And, and again, the, it being a village really lent itself to some pretty powerful first person interpretation. And so that went on through the 70s and in the 80s, and I got involved in the late 80s. But then as we experienced this, this paradigm shift that I'm talking about, we would start to explore the perspectives of non-soldiers, uh, bringing civilians into the program. And it could be, I mean, frankly, it could be you know, white males who you know, lived, owned some of the homes or businesses there in the village, but then we started bringing in white females. And then later on, we started bringing in more of the African-American voice, which in Appomattox, um, over 50% of the population in 1865 was African-American and 98% of those folks were enslaved. So having that perspective was fascinating because the surrender, of course, made emancipation more of a universal reality in rural places like Appomattox, uh, more so than the Emancipation Proclamation. Lee's surrender is what actually changed things uh, for the enslaved people in communities like Appomattox. And so that summer of 1865, it's literally, it's the unfolding of, it's the realization of emancipation and what it really meant not only to those formerly enslaved, but to those who formerly owned slaves. And so it just really, it really kind of blew up our interpretation uh, and expanded it significantly. Um, and I would say too, it also led us to explore more of the United States Colored Troop story at Appomattox. It had always been well documented that there were seven regiments of USCTs at Appomattox, um, but the academic understanding was pretty surface level in that it was probably about 2,000 soldiers. And an exhaustive study that we conducted, uh, Chris Bingham, one of the interpreters at Appomattox, led this study, literally looking at about 15,000 compiled service records of every soldier in those seven regiments. 
was able to determine that there were actually about 5,000 USCTs at Appomattox. And we knew their names, and in most cases, their ages, sometimes their occupations and where they came from. And they were not all former enslaved men. Some of them came from other countries. Some of them came from the North. Um, fascinating story. So yeah, it, it just, the whole interpretation just really, uh, it grew exponentially um, in, in the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, that's, that's great. It must have been um, so fascinating to hear all those new voices in those new stories um, within that context. Absolutely. And I think too, as frontline interpreters and uh, our historian at, at the park, Patrick Schroeder, and many other people that came in and out of the park that contributed to this, to this, to this quilt. Um, we, we had, I think what we had to do was learn that the traditional sources of information for the Appomattox campaign or the surrender, you know, were, were you know, your military sources, but also journals and diaries of the soldiers that participated, or maybe some civilians that witnessed some things. But I think it, what was uh, kind of mind changing for me, or, or just was going back and looking at some of the same resources that we had, but extracting different information out of it. Not only looking for the military story, but realizing that some of these exact same sources they were talking about USCTs, or they were talking about civilians in the village or around the county. Um, but the pure military researcher might not have been looking for that when that source was uncovered in the 1940s or the 1970s or whenever. Uh, so it, it started with just going back and looking at sources that we already had, but looking at them with a different lens. But then I think it also it involved looking for new sources that previously had been looked over or not even looked for. You know, for example, we realized that with the emancipation story, um, in the summer of 1865, the first black church developed right outside the village of Appomattox Courthouse. And, and, and that's not a coincidence. I think that's something we see all over the South. Um, and Galilee Baptist Church, you know, formed initially as a, as a black congregation right there outside of the village. It was, um, I've heard it called an arbor church. And they literally met under the trees uh, and then eventually built a log structure. But what we also see was that when the Freedmen's Bureau came in to establish educational opportunities for recently emancipated people, a lot of times these schools were set up with physically with the churches. And so um, we also know that a lot of times these quote unquote black churches were spinoffs of white churches where these folks had attended with their owners. And we realized that, hey, there's records in the white church that have a lot to do with the creation of Galilee, or what would become Galilee Baptist Church. Um, also, the Southern Claims Commission, you know, civilians that are you know, making claims against, not against, but to the federal government for compensation for property lost or damaged at the hands of uh, federal military. We realized that in Appomattox, there were at least three African-American men that filed claims. And of course, these are pretty detailed applications about themselves, about their loyalties to the union, and of course, about what happened and why they lost the property that they did. So that's not something that the traditional military researchers might have looked at in the past. And now all of a sudden, we were realizing that, you know, if you look for it, there might be more than, than we once thought. You know, the old school of thought was a lot of the African-American history was probably oral history. And then everybody had their own thoughts about, you know, how reliable is that? Uh, and it's true, there certainly is oral history. And, uh, but what we're finding is, what I think we found was that there's a lot more out there that, that could be researched. You just have to want to do it and you have to do the work, but it can be found and it's there. Yeah, it's amazing the um, different ways that there are to interpret documents. So kind of, um, kind of spinning off of that question and that topic, um, what would you say, um, have, there any been, have there been any, um, any documents or any records that have been of particular interest to you? Um, anything that you found particularly fascinating or anything like that? There's a lot, of course. Um, uh, and, you know, and I should say, I've, I left Appomattox two and a half, almost three years ago. So um, 
I'm not there right now. Um, in fact, right now I'm working at Camp Nelson National Monument in uh, Kentucky, Central Kentucky, which is a major United States Colored Troop recruiting center, as it turned out during the war. Um, so I do, I do find that there's some overlap in the things we did at Appomattox and, and what we can do here. Particularly fascinating, well, you know, um, Appomattox isn't known for being a battle site because the, the surrender story just kind of takes over the legacy of Appomattox, understandably. But there, there, were, there was fighting at Appomattox and there were soldiers killed literally on the last day of, of the Army of Northern Virginia's war. And um, there's also one that we know of, one civilian casualty at Appomattox and it happened to be an enslaved woman. Her name was Hannah Reynolds. Now we've known that throughout the park's history that Hannah Reynolds was killed on the morning of April the 9th by an artillery shell um, and that hit her arm. That's about all that was known. And the assumption that most of us had was that, well, if this poor woman was hit by an artillery shell, surely she died on April the 9th. Um, at the very least, she would bleed out. Um, if, if, you know, it's, a, it's a, just an awful thing to, to think about. But um, one document that was uncovered by a local historian in Appomattox, uh, Reverend Al Jones, um, who we worked a lot with uh, in the making of the film and the 150th uh, event in 2015, and, and, and part of the, the general partnership that we formed with the African-American community in Appomattox before the 150th. But Reverend Jones, in his research, he actually found a death record for Hannah Reynolds. And the, the amazing thing about that record was that it, it listed her as dying on April the 12th, not April the 9th, which we had all assumed. And again, nobody bothered to try to find Hannah Reynolds' death record. It took somebody to take the time to say, hey, I wonder if we can find it. And there it was. And she died on April the 12th. So um, they, that, that was very... Um, enlightening, I think, for a lot of us interpretively to think of this woman enslaved um, living just outside the village, just west of the village, and, and, and on the battle, right in the epicenter of the battlefield on the morning of April the 9th. A very dangerous place to be, for sure, and, and she was hit. And we don't know if she was conscious or what her condition was from the time she was hit until the time that she died, but the idea that this woman, um, an adult woman, you know, would, would witness this event and, and, and actually be a casualty of it, uh, I think really sparked the interpretive imaginations of a lot of us. And then her story became quite a central part of the 150th at Appomattox. And we actually, in, in, in the true form of our first person living history tradition at Appomattox, uh, we decided to um, and we, we admitted that we don't know what her funeral was like or if she even had one. We have no idea. But we decided in the spirit of first person to recreate her funeral as a, as a way to talk about her death and, and the circumstances of her death and the significance of it. And it, it, it kind of, um, it, was, it was a powerful thing to bring that story into the Appomattox Surrender Commemoration. So that was certainly one piece of research, one document that, that had a big change on how we did things at Appomattox, certainly for the 150th. And I would say from now on, I think a lot more people know Hannah Reynolds' name now than they did before 2015. Yeah, wow, that sounds like an amazing thing to discover and an amazing experience to sort of recreate that um, funeral procession. So kind of on the, um, on the note of living history, or in um, public history and things like that. So what would you say the similarities and differences are between visiting a national park site such as Appomattox and reading a book or an article? Well, people who have visited Civil War sites and historical sites in general, but particularly military sites, I think, you know, we all understand, uh, we all have that moment when we read about a battle, like, like, like Gettysburg, you know, you read about it, it's very dramatic, um, but then you go there and the slightest changes in topography 
can totally change your understanding of how a particular soldier or a regiment experienced all the artillery fire on July 3rd before the charge. What do you mean they couldn't see the other side? And you know, you go out there and explore the Confederate line and you understand, oh yeah, the topography was such that you don't see on a two-dimensional map. So I think obviously that, that that's true for Appomattox too. Um, the fighting there uh, is very much affected by the topography and what the soldiers saw and experienced. And you can only understand that if you walk the ground. But I think too, like any uh, historic site, what happened at Appomattox is so powerful. I mean, all battlefields are powerful. They're sacred, hallowed ground. And it's, and it's the, the sacrifices that are made on these battlefields are truly, I think, incomprehensible uh, for the living. Uh, but at Appomattox, you not only have the fighting, but you have this story of the surrender and particularly the stacking of arms ceremony when the Con Confederate infantry comes into the village on April 12th to lay down their, their, their weapons, their, their tools of war, their flags even. And in front of about 5,000 soldiers, um, the first division of the Union Fifth Corps there on the road. And so I think at Appomattox, one of the many things that's special is whether or not you had an ancestor that participated in that ceremony or whether or not you just have read about it and have some understanding of it and its power, but to know that you can walk not only on the battlefield, but you can walk on the road, the road. We're talking about a eight, 10 foot wide road and it's there and you can, you can stand. And if you know, uh, if, you had, if, if you had an ancestor in, in the first division of the fifth corps that day, we know where on the road each regiment was posted and you could actually stand within feet of your ancestor on that road. Or if you know your ancestor was a Confederate who laid down their arms on that road, we know where that ceremony began and where it ended on the road. You can walk that road and you know that at one point you were exactly where that happened. Uh, whether it was your ancestor or just your understanding of the story um, is extraordinarily powerful. And, and you're looking at buildings, homes, um, that were there then. So the courthouse building burned in 1892 and was reconstructed, but the Clover Hill Tavern, the Isbel House, the Piers House, these other buildings, they're there. And um, yeah, they've been, they've been restored and, and taken care of and things have been replaced on those buildings. Yeah, but th those buildings were there when that happened. And uh, wow, what a, what a surreal thing to walk onto that ground at such a pivotal moment in the war, but in the lives of these men and in the legacy, you know, the legacy of the war is so much shaped by what happened at Appomattox, how it ended. Um, and we're still dealing with it to this day. It's, it, we're still unpack unpackaging what it meant. Um, yes, the generals were cordial to one another. Yes, the stacking of arms ceremony was largely cordial among the soldiers, but there were so many things uh, left unsaid or unsettled at Appomattox that that we are we are left to deal with right now and we continue to deal with it. So it's an extraordinarily powerful place. I, I you know I don't want to sound like a broken record. Uh, all all of these national parks and historic sites are, but I think that's what speaks to me about Appomattox. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because wow, I can only imagine just walking through um, a place that has such um, historical on um, both the na nationwide and to an individual, a personal, um, just a personal um, significance yeah. and just walking right through that line of um, that physical place with all that um, all history just sounds absolutely like surreal and powerful experience to be sure. Right, and now we can add to that landscape. The park is working on developing uh, interpretively the site where Hannah Reynolds was killed, mortally wounded. And so, you know, that's another experience that I think will happen in the future. So just part of that expanding story, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you, it sounds like the um, Appomattox is just a really, such a fascinating place and such a historically significant place, of course. Um, so 
for anyone who might be interested in um, working in or volunteering with um, Appomattox or just the National Park Service in general, do you have any advice for people who would be interested in such a thing? Absolutely. Um, if, if there's if there's a, a, a specific park that you're interested in, uh, I, I would simply go to that park. I would introduce yourself. I would talk to, you know, if you're interested in <clears throat> volunteering or interning or working as a seasonal in the, say, the interpretive division, which is what I'm talking about, what I did at Appomattox and what I, that's always been my career is interpretation and visitor services. Then go and just talk to those people, whether it's a supervisor or a chief of interp, um, <clears throat> find out, you know, what you can about that park and let them tell you specifically what the opportunities are at that park. But I can say universally, volunteering at a park is a great thing to do, not just for the obvious uh, public service, but it's a way to get specific experience for yourself and for you to understand if you really like it, you might think you like it, but volunteering will give you a chance to prove to yourself, to, to say, you know, is, is this really what I thought it was? And, it, and it, is it truly as rewarding as it was for me? And it is for me, but you know, try it yourself. But also it allows you to build those experiences on your resume. So if you're, if you're a student or you're looking for a seasonal job or maybe a permanent job, Having that experience on your resume is huge because it tells a future hiring authority person that, hey, you had an opportunity to spend your time doing whatever you wanted and you chose to volunteer at a park. But it also means you got experience, firsthand experience, but it also means that now there are people in the park service that know your work. They can speak to your work. You know, how do you interact with visitors? How do you process this historical information how do you share it? You know, are you good at these things? And, and what's your, your disposition and willingness to learn more about it and, and become even better at it? Um, so I think volunteering or going after seasonal jobs is, uh, is the best way to do it. You know, there's a lot of people that love the National Park Service and love the idea of working for the Park Service. So these may not be, you're not going to become a millionaire working in the park service, but the competition can be stiff because it's a desirable thing that a lot of people do want to do. They're not doing it for the money. They do it because they love the work. So that's your competition. And um, so, um, I, but definitely talk to people at the parks where you want to work and, and get it, get that direct advice from them they can tell you uh, the best way to get that experience, whether it's volunteering or what seasonal jobs they might have coming up and when to look for those jobs. You know, if you're look interested in a summer seasonal job, looking in April or May is too late. Uh, a lot of those announcements come out the previous fall or winter. And so you need to have a plan. You need to understand how the process works. And so if you're talking to, you know, the, the parks that you're interested in, they can, they can guide you on all that information. And, it's, it's, it is, it's something you need to investigate. You need to learn how to use usajobs.gov. You need to know how that works, set up your profile and that system. That's where all these federal jobs are announced. That's how you will ultimately apply for the paid jobs. But there's also volunteer.gov and you, know, you can explore what volunteer opportunities there are. And, and I would become familiar with both and, and talk to people at, at the parks you're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one last question. Um, we're just about out of time. But sure. is there anything you'd like to add um, to anything that we've discussed today or any further point you'd like to elaborate on? Well, I, you know, I, I would say I could talk about Appomattox forever. Um, and, and I actually thought I might do that. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I do have a great opportunity here at Camp Nelson. I get to be the first superintendent at a new national park site here at Camp Nelson. So that's, that's very exciting. exciting. And it would take something very exciting for me not to be at Appomattox. Um, <clears throat> but but I, I would say um, for those people out there listening, particularly if you're high school, college age, you know, young, under 30, you know, whatever young means, but, but if you're thinking about the park service, <clears throat> excuse me, um, know that the park service is hungry to um, hear from young people. And so if you think you might wanna do something like this, 
Uh, and as I said, the competition can be stiff, but if you're passionate and, and you, you, you really love this type of work, uh, go for it, do it, reach out. The Park Service wants to hear from you. The Park Service needs you, really. And, and uh, we, we have to get our young voices uh, in, this, in, this, in this symphony to be heard. Um, and, and, you know, I, I talked earlier in this about a paradigm shift that I got to witness. Come be part of the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That was um, a really fascinating and um, interesting discussion, both about the park itself and the research. And it was just absolutely um, fascinating and very insightful. So thank you. My pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, Abby, for having me. <laughs> yeah, of course.